Well, good morning, everyone. We are so glad that you chose to come and join us for worship this Sunday morning. Uh, we're just so excited for uh, what God is going to do today. Um, obviously, Pastor Jeff is not here. Uh, he's leading the, the group that's in um, Israel that's touring around seeing all the uh, historic biblical sites there. So please uh, keep them uh, in your prayers as they are over there and as they travel. Um, I have a few announcements that I want to make real quickly before we get started. Uh, first, um, I just want to remind uh, any youth that we have, uh, we're going to be uh, going to Winter Jam on Friday, March 11th. Uh, the, the deadline to sign up is the end of April, or end of April, end of February. I don't know where April came from. Um, actually, I know where April came from. I was looking at another date for another deadline, but end of February, so February 28th, if you would like your child to, to attend that, your student, please have them sign up before that. Um, now, where April comes into play, um, our camps, our uh, children's camps, youth camps, mission serve, um, all those sign-ups are going on for children's camp. Um, the deadline for me to have a really good idea on how many spots to get is March 5th. We'll probably still have a few spots after that available, but if you want to be sure that your child has a spot to go to our children's camp, which is June 9th through 11th, if they could sign up um, by next Sunday, um, that would be great. And then for our youth camp and mission serve, uh, those dates are in your bulletin, but the deadline for that is April 2nd. Uh, so please make sure you're, you're aware of that. Um, we have our Club SBC Easter celebration. That's going to be April 5th. That's a Wednesday night, so it starts at 545 to 7. And for our Club SBC Easter celebration and the town's Easter event, Spring Fest, uh, we're going to be starting collecting um, Easter candy. Um, so if you would like to donate some individually wrapped um, candy, please uh, bring that. We'll have some places for you to, um, to donate that. So um, that's all the announcements we have. Before we go into our time of greeting, we have a message that we want to show everyone. This is your team that's over in Israel. We're at the old the Jaffa Gate in the city of Jerusalem. As you can see behind us, this is part of the old city. We just wanted to greet you this morning with a very brief phrase. Jesus loves you and so do we. Amen. All right, I think that's, that's pretty cool that we were able to uh, hear from them and, and see where they're at just a little bit. So, again, just keep them in your prayers. And now we just want to ask everyone if you would please stand and take a few moments to welcome each other.
join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for uh, this opportunity for us just to come into your presence and worship you. Um, Father, we, we stand here all gathered together, uh, united in our belief that you are the one true God, the creator of the heavens and the earth. And God, you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. And God, we just pray that everything that we do today would honor you. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
cornerstone that God built his kingdom on and he is with us and we are with him and it's just something to, to sing about how firm a foundation we have that can carry us through every storm Coming this morning from Ephesians 2 8 through 10. <clears throat> For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. As we go with the Lord in prayer this morning, which everyone be in. Uh, Remembrance of prayer for the Hyla family uh, they're on their loss. We go to the Lord in prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the day that we have to come out and worship you. I just pray that you'll give each one the ability to get something from the message, dear Lord, that we'll, they put in their heart and, and live by it each and every day. I just pray as we come and give these tithes and offerings that they may use for the furtherance of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.
Thank you so much, choir. That was beautiful. That was one of my favorite songs. Even as a kid, I can remember singing that song uh, when I was very young. So thank you so much for that. Um, I want to invite any children that we have to come forward uh, as we get ready to go to Children's Church. We'll read our scripture and pray, and then we'll head out to Children's Church. Good morning, y'all. So today in Children's Church, um, y'all are going to be talking about how, oh, hello, we'll wait for y'all. There you go. Okay, so we're going to be talking about how God is merciful, okay? And y'all are going to learn what that means, what God being merciful means in just a little bit. But I just want to read one verse for you, and then I'm going to pray for you guys, okay? So it's from Psalms 145, and it's verse 9. It says, the Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works, because God is merciful. So let me pray for you guys, and then we'll head over to this door, and we'll, y'all head out for Children's Church. Let's pray. Let's bow our heads, close our eyes. Dear God, we thank you so much for this day, and God, we thank you that you are merciful, that, that you show love and forgiveness, and, and God, you, you don't give us the, the punishment that we deserve. You show us mercy because you love us. And we just pray that you would help us to learn more about that in Children's Church today. And it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So again, I am very uh, excited and humbled that I get another opportunity just to uh, stand before you all and just share God's word um, with you. And... Um, just as always, just it's a great honor, and we want to keep Pastor Jeff and the rest of that group in our prayers as, as they're over in Israel. But um, I'm just very excited um, just for this opportunity. So as we get started this morning, I want to share a story with you that happened maybe two or three days ago. So I, I, was, I was at home. I was just kind of going through the normal routine of just doing things that I normally do. And uh, Micah, she works night, so she sleeps a lot during the day, and so she, she was asleep, and so I was with Ender, and um, Ender was in the living room with me, and I was doing some clothes, and um, I was getting ready to fold um, some laundry that I'd just taken out of the dryer, and Ender was ready for a snack, so went and got him his snack, and um, so Ender kind of has this routine now. He, he only gets his pacifier when he's sleeping, so if he's taking a nap or at night, he'll have his pacifier, so I just got him up from his nap, so he still had the pacifier in. I sit him down, and I, and I go and get him his snack. And so I bring him into the living room, and I put his snack on his little bowl on the ground and put his cup of water there. And then I do like this to walk over to where I have the clothes. And I hear, huh. I look back, and Ender had his pacifier in his hand like this. And so what he's been doing lately is whenever we've been giving him, you know, his snack or if he set his pacifier in and he's getting a bottle or we're brushing his teeth or whatever it is, he hands us his pacifier. But in that moment, you know, I, I had all these clothes I needed to fold, had all this stuff I was doing, I hand him a snack, and I walk away. I, I forgot that for him, that, that was very important. That was a very important thing. He wants to hand me his pacifier. And so I just completely just ignored it, went over, and then he reminded me very quick, hey, this is important. And I think a lot of times in life, we can overlook those important things. You know, that something that seems kind of small, it can be very easy to kind of overlook it, even though it may be very important. And today, we're going to look at one of those types of stories that's in the scripture. A story that could very easily be kind of read past, read over. It's not one of the typical stories that we learn about as children. You know, most of our children, they could tell you about Adam and Eve. They could tell you about Jonah and, and, and the big fish. They, they could tell you about Zacchaeus that climbed up the sycamore tree. They, they could tell you about Noah and the ark, how he built the ark and the great flood. But today, we're, we're going to learn about a different Noah. See, there's another Noah in the Bible. And, and this Noah 
was not a patriarch of a family. This Noah was not tasked to, to build anything that would save the human race, that, that would be the, the starting point for um, human, humanity on the earth. This Noah was not even a man. The Noah we're going to look at this morning was a woman, was a young woman, and, and we're going to be looking about her and, and her sisters. She had four sisters. And we meet this Noah and, and her sisters in Numbers chapter 26, verse 33. Now again, just like I did with Ender when he took that pacifier out and I just kind of overlooked it, this is a verse, Numbers 26, verse 33, that we can read right past and never understand the true significance and we can miss the lessons that God has for us. So hopefully you're already in Numbers chapter 26 and, and before we actually look at this verse and some of the other verses to help us understand this and its importance, I want to give you a little bit of background about the book of Numbers. So Numbers, as you may have guessed from the name of the book, is a book of numbers. It contains a lot of numbers and a lot of names. And the book of Numbers is broken up into two main sections. So the first section would be chapters 1 through 25. And so in these chapters, we see Moses um, taking a census of all the people of Israel and then preparing them as they march to the Holy Land, the, the land of Canaan, the promised land that God has given them. And then along the way, some things happen. They make some mistakes. The journey takes way longer than it should. There's some judgment that happens. And then in the second half of Numbers, chapters 26 through 36, we see a second census. And again, Moses preparing the people to again march to the promised land. And so it's important for us to understand that this book is two census taking place. Censuses, since I, I don't really know what the plural of census is, but there's two census, all right, two of them. And in chapter 26, we're right in the middle of that second census. And every male that was 20 years of age or older was counted. And so in this chapter, in 26, you're going to see all of the different tribes of Israel named and counted so they could have a number and they could know how many men are represented. So again, this chapter is full of a bunch of numbers and a bunch of weird names, and we're going to get to learn a few of those names this morning. But why all the numbers? Why all the names? Why is that important for us? Well, the Bible is a book that contains many different types of literature. They're not all the, the moving stories. They're not all the, you know, poetry. There is poetry. There are stories. There's prophecy. There's law. There's laments. But then there's also history. And specifically, the history that we find in the Bible is God's history. It's the history about his people, Israel. And one really big thing, and, and someone said this when I was listening to a lot of different things as I was preparing for this message, there's a big difference between interesting and important. There's a lot of things in the Bible that are just not interesting. They're not going to jump out of the page. It's not a story of someone fighting a giant or defeating hundreds of men. But that doesn't mean it's not important. And this census is just as important. And so, when we come to chapter 26, 40 years has passed since that first census. And in that time, God has punished an entire generation for their lack of faith. Now, you may recall this story, but when the people of Israel first got to the land of Canaan, they sent 12 spies, one from each tribe to go and scout out the land to see if it was good, to see if it was worth them entering into. And when those spies came back, they gave their report, and only two spies, Joshua and Caleb, 
were of the opinion that they should go and take the land that God had promised them because God had indeed promised them that land. They saw these giants. They saw that it was a great, great land, great food. It was perfect, but they saw the giants and they were afraid. So the other ten, we don't need to go in there. They were against going in, but Caleb and Joshua trusted in God's promise. So because of their lack of faith, we see, and we can read this in Numbers chapter 26, verses 64 through 65. It says, Among these, there was not a man of those who were numbered by Moses and Aaron the priests when they numbered the children of Israel in the wilderness of Sinai. For the Lord had said of them, They shall surely die in the wilderness. So there was not left a man of them except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Because of their lack of faith, all of that generation but two men and Moses died in the wilderness. And so now in chapter 26, to give you a little bit of context, we see that Moses is with all that's remaining. The rest of that generation has already died, and they're doing another census to kind of see where they stand. How many men, 20 and older, are left? And so that's what this chapter is. Names and numbers. But what made this census so important? Well, the Bible tells us that. Numbers 26, verses 52 and 56. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, To these the land shall be divided as an inheritance, according to the number of names. To a large tribe you shall give a larger inheritance, and to a small tribe you shall give a smaller inheritance. Each shall be given its inheritance according to those who were numbered of them, but the land shall be divided by lot. They shall inherit according to the names of the tribes of their fathers, according to the lot their inheritance shall be divided between the larger and the smaller. That was what this census was really about. It was listing all of the names of all the males, all the fathers, and the numbers, so that when they got to this promised land, they could divide up the land amongst the whole nation of Israel fairly. Now, Israel, up until this point, they just roamed around. They didn't own land. They didn't have any land. This was never something they had to even deal with before. No one owned land. They just kind of moved from place to place. But now, the Lord is promising them land. And with that, God needs a plan on how to divide that up. And so, part of it, God used the casting of lots. But another part was the numbering and naming of all of the tribes, all of the clans, so that the land could be fairly divided. So that kind of lets us see the importance of this chapter. This chapter had to deal with their inheritance, what they were going to receive, their property, their land. And that wasn't just land like, okay, yeah, I own 15 acres, that's my hunting land. For these people... This was their livelihood. Land meant they could have gardens, that they could own animals, that they could provide food, that there was work available for, the, for them, that they could provide for their family. That, that's what land meant. That's what this inheritance was. So this was extremely important. And the way God chose to distribute that land was by naming all of the men, all of the fathers, all of the sons, and that's how it was divided. That's, that's who was counted. Any man that was 20 years of age and older. So now let's look at our verse for this morning. So Numbers chapter 26, verse 33. Now, I would ask if you're able and willing, would you please stand as we read God's word together? If you would just read along silently with me, I read this verse for us. Numbers chapter 26, verse 33. It says, Now Zalaphahad, the son of Hefer, had no sons but daughters. 
And the names of the daughters of Zelophehad were Mela, Noah, Hagla, Milcah, and Tirzah. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for your word. And God, I pray that you would help us to see how every word that you have given us in your word is important. How every word, every passage, every verse can teach us important lessons that we can apply to our lives today. And so, Father, I pray that you would speak to us this morning, that it wouldn't be me, that it wouldn't be, be my words, but, God, that you would speak to us through your word. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. So, like I said before, this verse, with all of its difficult names, <laughs> would be very easy for us to just read over and read past. And... I think if most of us were reading numbers from chapter 1 all the way through, when we got to this verse, we would probably read it and then just keep reading. And we would miss its significance. But when we got to chapter 27, we would realize the importance of this verse. And so, so we can understand that. I want us to turn, if you would, just flip over one page, or it might be on the same page in your Bible, but to chapter 27 of Numbers. And we're going to look through verses 1 through 11 to better understand the importance of these five daughters of Zelophehad and what lessons they can teach us. This, this Noah that we may have never heard of before, the lessons that we can learn from her and her siblings. So first, we're going to see in verses 1 through 4 of Numbers 27 that these five daughters had a problem. So if you read along with me, verses 1 through 4, it says, Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Maker, the son of Manasseh, from the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these were the names of his daughters, Mela, Noah, Hagla, Milka and Tirza. And they stood before Moses, before Eleazar the priest, and before the leaders of all the congregation by the doorway of the tabernacle of meeting, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, but he was not in the company of those who gathered together against the Lord, in company with Korah, but he died in his own sin and had no sons. Why should the name of our father be removed from among his family because he had no son. Give us a possession among our father's brothers. So these five sisters had a problem. Now, as we've discussed, how the land was to be divided was through the men. The father would pass on the land to the son and so forth. But these five daughters, their father, Zelophehad, had no sons. He just had daughters. So in this process of inheritance, they received nothing. And not only did they not receive any land, did they not have anything to, to provide for themselves, but their father's name, since he had no sons, would have been lost. See, Zelophehad was a part of this faithless generation, this generation that was punished because of their lack of faith in God to provide this land for them, so they had to wander in the desert for 40 years. And so these men were not to be remembered. But their sons were. They still had a legacy. Their names still were in, in memory, they still had their line that was carried on through their sons, even though they weren't granted to be able to be entered into the, uh, the promised land. Through their sons, their name would be carried on. But Zelophehad had, had no sons. So he was going to be forgotten. So these daughters, Noah and her sisters, they had two problems. They had no land. They had nothing for themselves, nothing that they could provide for themselves, and their father's name was not going to be remembered in the promised land. And I find it very interesting 
what they do. You know, it says they, they come to before Moses, and we're going to get to that in just a second, but when they get to where Moses is, in verse 3, it says, Our father died in the wilderness, but he was not in the company of those who gathered together against the Lord in company with Korah, but he died in his own sin, and he had no sons. See, Korah, um, he kind of led this rebellion, so to speak, among the Israelites because there was this group of people that they looked at Moses, they, they looked at Aaron, and they said, hey, why does Moses get to speak for God? Why does Aaron get to be the priest? I can do that. Korah wanted to be that messenger for God. So they led this rebellion against God and against God's chosen servants. And the Bible says that the Lord actually caused the earth to swallow them up. And it was about almost 15,000 people. And these daughters made it known very early, hey, our father was not a part of that. He respected you as God's leader. He respected the Lord. He was not a part of that rebellion, but he did die in his own sin. They were very upfront about, hey, our father, he sinned against the one true God, and he had to face the punishment for that. They didn't hide their father's sin. They didn't shy away from it. They acknowledged it. And the reason I think they were so bold is because they truly believed and trusted in the promises of God. And they knew that for one that admitted their sin, repented of their sin, that God offered forgiveness. Isn't that who God has made his promises to? For those that don't try to hide their sin, don't try to hide their rebellion against God, but for those that confess their sin, admit their sin, and take their sin before a holy God, isn't that who God makes his promises of inheritance to? Isn't that all of us in this room? And that's what we see these sisters doing. And so the first lesson I believe that we can learn from Noah and her sisters is that we need to believe and trust in God's promises. See, these sisters, they had a faith and a trust that when God said he was going to bring all of his people to the promised land and provide them with land, they trusted that God would make a way. And even when they were faced with this problem, they didn't let the problem override their belief in the promise of God. We as a church, we've been promised things by the Lord. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, that every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ is promised for us. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to have all the worldly blessings, that we're going to have all the wealth, that we're going to have a prosperous life and everything that we do. But it says that every spiritual blessing. If you're in Christ, Bible promises that while this world may fall apart around you, your spirit, your soul, you're given the Holy Spirit to live, in, to live within you. Your soul is secure in Christ. And you will receive every spiritual blessing. You will grow in the faith and knowledge through the Lord Jesus Christ. You are promised that. Do you believe that? Do you trust in God's promises even when things around you get difficult? Or do you run to things in this world when things go wrong, do, do you run to your job? Do you run to your friends? Do, do you run to those coping mechanisms that we all have, whether, whether it's drugs, alcohol, relationships? Do we run to those things when things get tough? Do we run to doubt? Or do we run to the promises of God? Because that's what these sisters did. So we see after, after they see their problem, after they know, hey, because of the census, 
we're not going to have any land. Our father is he's going to be forgotten. They trusted in God's promises, but look at how they handled the problem. It says in verse 2, they stood before Moses, before Eleazar the priest, and before the leaders in all the congregation by the doorway of the tabernacle of meeting. They had a problem. What did they do? They went to Moses. They went to the priest. They went to all the leaders. Outside the temple of meeting where God dwelled. They had a problem. They took it to God. They took it to Moses, to Eleazar, those men that were chosen to be the spokesmen for God. They had a problem. They took it straight to the Lord. Because they trusted in the promises of God, they knew, hey, God can handle this. So what did they do? They didn't go Google, right? They, they, they didn't go call Mama. They didn't go find, you know, someone else. They went to the Lord. When we have problems in our life, we need to be bold and have confidence in the Lord. Think about what these five sisters did. They, they were women in a society where the patriarchy kind of ruled. Right? And, and even we see in that census, it was through the men that they were going to divide up the land. Now, now this was done because the men were chosen to uh, protect and steward that land. Not, they didn't own it per se, but they were given it to you to help the entire family. But for these five daughters to come before Moses, like the chief of the whole nation before Eleazar, the, the high priest, that took extraordinary courage. That took great boldness because, well, let's look at what they said. I mean, read verse 4. It says, why should the name of our father be removed from among his family because he had no son? Give us a possession among our father's brothers. They didn't say, would you please consider giving us a possession? No, it says, give us. Why should our father not have a possession among his brothers. This is wrong. So give us the land that would be promised to his sons. They trusted in the promises of God, and so then when it came to addressing their problem, they were bold and they were confident. They took their problem straight to Moses, but they were bold. How many times when we face a problem, we're very timid with it? We're afraid to bring up the problem to others. We're afraid to ask the Lord, hey, God, I'm struggling with this, and I know what your promises say, but I'm still struggling. The Bible teaches us that, as we said in Ephesians, every spiritual blessing is promised to us. So if you're fighting that battle with sin, be bold when you take that before the Lord. Don't say, well, God, if it's your will, take away this addiction. No. Be bold. Ephesians says we're given every spiritual blessing. Have the boldness. Have the confidence. The Holy Spirit's inside of you. He will bring you through that. But you need the boldness and the confidence. When you see injustice, be bold. Be confident. That's what these five daughters did. The writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 4, 16, to come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Are you bold? When you're faced with a problem, do you come boldly before God? Or do you say, hey, pray for me. Pastor Brandon, pray for me. I'm struggling with this, but... You're the last person to get on your knees and bring your problem before the Lord. Be bold. Take it before the Lord. So this is their problem. They have no land. They have no inheritance. Their father would be forgotten. 
but they know that it's wrong. They trust God's promises, and they boldly bring it before God. And in verse 5, we see how Moses responds. And I I love this. It says in verse 5, So Moses brought their case before the Lord. When you don't know what to do, when you don't know how to respond to a situation, bring it to the Lord. That's what Moses did. So this, this third lesson that we can learn, we've already learned that, that we need to trust in the promises of God and that we need to have boldness and confidence in the Lord. But this third lesson is we need to be like Moses and seek the Lord. Moses sought the Lord in this difficult situation. He demonstrated what true leadership should be. He didn't give his opinion. He didn't say, okay, well, yeah, y'all, y'all are right. This does sound like a problem. Let me do this, this, and this. He took it to the Lord. That's a leader. Not his opinion, not what he thought, but he took it to God. In the New Testament, we're also encouraged to do that. James 1.5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all liberally without reproach and it will be given to him if you lack wisdom if if you're dealing with a problem you're searching through the scriptures you you can't find the answer you just don't know what to do and you just keep turning to everywhere else and you can't find the answer ask god listen to james if you lack wisdom ask Be like Moses. Seek the Lord. Pastor Jeff has said this. I think I've said it to the youth before. In this book is the answer to all of our problems. But you know what? You may read it and not be able to find it. That's where you need to ask the Lord. And he, through the power of the Holy Spirit, as our teacher, as our counselor, he will guide you and lead you into that wisdom that you seek. So you may think, well, it's just me trying to figure out what school I should go to after high school. There's no way that's in here. James 1, 5. If you lack wisdom, ask the Lord. Well, it's just me having a difficult time in my marriage, and I don't really think God deals it specifically with that. Ask the Lord. Seek the Lord. He will give you the wisdom. Because Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Old Testament, he didn't know. He didn't have it written down. But he had to ask the Lord. Moses shows us the example of what it looks like to ask for wisdom. So lastly, we're going to see the solution to their problem. So Numbers 27, verses 6 through 11. It says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophehad, speak what is right. You shall surely give them a possession of inheritance among their father's brothers, and cause the inheritance of their father to pass to them. And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, If a man dies and has no son... Then you shall cause his inheritance to pass to his daughter. If he has no daughter, then you shall give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to his father's brothers. And if his father has no brothers, then you shall give his inheritance to the relative closest to him in his family, and he shall possess it. And it shall be to the children of Israel a statute of judgment, just as the Lord commanded Moses. So we see here, these daughters took their problem before the Lord, and God said, the daughters of Zelophehad speak what is right. Because they trusted in God's promise, because they had boldness, and because Moses sought the Lord, it says God saw that what they seek is right. And so he actually puts into place a process for inheritance recognizing, hey, what do we do when there are no sons? And this was unheard of during this time. Women, especially in in the culture outside of Israel, 
Women were just there. It was the men that were important. In the nations outside of Israel, the women were treated horribly. They were used. I won't go into all the ways that they were used, but you could do some study and find out how the, uh, these other religions and these other cultures used women. It was horrible. But even when we look at the nation of Israel, it all fell through the men. That was just how they did things. But because these women, these five daughters, knew there was a problem, trusted in the Lord, had boldness, God did something that had never been done before. And he made an allotment for these daughters to receive an inheritance. The fourth lesson that we can learn from Noah and her sisters is that God cares about those that we often overlook. The unlovable, the outcast. Psalms 10.14 says that God is the helper of the fatherless. Psalm 68.5 says he is the father of the fatherless the defender of widows. And in the New Testament, we see that James tells us in chapter 1, verse 27, that pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Visit literally means to look after and care for. Because God cares for those who we overlook. He cared for these daughters. These daughters that were going to be passed over, that were going to be forgotten, that were not going to have an inheritance. He cared for them. So he made a way for them to have land. But what's interesting is in Numbers chapter 36, this whole issue is addressed again. Because some of the men in their tribe, so the tribe of Manasseh, one of the two sons of Joseph, because Joseph didn't have his own tribe. Two, both of his sons were given their own tribe because uh, the tribe of Levi were the priests. So you had to have another tribe. So the tribe of Manasseh, some of the men were thinking about this. Well, if one of these five daughters marries someone from another tribe, we will lose the land that was promised to our fathers, to our people. So this is what God says. Verse 6, Numbers 36, verse 6. This is what the Lord commands concerning the daughters of Zelophehad, saying, let them marry whom they think best, but they may marry only within the family of their father's tribe. That was the solution. Hey, you can marry whoever you think is best as long as they're in your father's tribe. That way the land stayed within that tribe, that family, that promised inheritance. Now, it also interested me, 1 Corinthians 7, verse 39, in the New Testament, it's dealing with a widow whose husband has died and does she have the right to remarry and and you know, Paul was teaching, yeah, of course she can remarry, but unto the Lord. You can marry whoever you want as long as it's unto the Lord. So any young person in this room, think about that. Zelophehad's daughters were free to marry whoever they wish as long as they met certain qualifications from the Lord. Don't let your relationships be just about what you want. But do as 1 Corinthians 7 says, and do it unto the Lord. Are they godly? Do they help you grow closer to God? But let's see what these daughters did. So they seek the Lord. They, they realize their problem. They're bold. And then God kind of gives them a stipulation. But you have to marry someone from your tribe. In verse 10, chapter 36, it says, Just as the Lord commanded Moses, so did the daughters of Zelophehad. From Mela. Tirza, Hagla, Milka, and Noah, the daughters of Zelophehad, were married to the sons of their father's brothers. The fifth lesson that we can learn from Noah and her sisters is that we need to be obedient. When we have a problem, when we recognize that problem, when we take that problem to the Lord, 
when we trust in God's promises, when we're bold, when we seek the Lord on it, then we need to be obedient. When we ask for wisdom and God gives it to us, we need to be obedient to what he says because that's what these daughters did. We need to trust and be obedient to the will of God. Jesus calls us to obey. In John chapter 4, or John chapter 14, verse 15, it says, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love God, if you seek after God, you should obey. But the final lesson we can learn, now we're going to go all the way back to where we started. Numbers 26, verse 33. I want to read this verse one more time. Now remember, this was to be the men, the sons, not including those 40 of the faithless, those those men that were in the 40 years, the faithless generation. But what does verse 33 say? Now Zelophehad, the son of Hefer, had no sons but daughters. And the names of the daughters of Zelophehad were Mela, Noah, Hagla, Milcah, and Tirzah. Can you see the grace of God in that verse? There were no sons. His name should not be in this census. There were no other women mentioned. But Zelophehad, who died in his sin, his name is written. These daughters were given an inheritance. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. We didn't deserve our name written down. We didn't deserve an inheritance in heaven with Him forever. We didn't deserve a relationship with Him. But God, by His grace, He'll write your name. If you'll just do, as John 1, 12 says, and believe. For all who did receive Him, who believed in His name, He gave them the right to become children. Of God. God's grace is amazing. We see that through the story of Noah and her sisters. We see that God will forgive sin, that God will make a way for us to receive the blessings and promises. So what do we do with the story? What do we do with, with Noah and her sisters? Well, do you trust in God's promises over your life? Are you bold like Noah and her sisters were? When you see a situation, when, when you see things that are not going the way the Lord commands, are you bold? Do you seek the Lord when you have a problem and you don't know the answer? Do you ask him for wisdom? Do you obey what the Lord commands us to do? And have you trusted in his grace? Because God has an inheritance. He has a place for you. The Bible tells us in Romans 8, verse 17, and if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If you believe in Christ, you're an heir. He has a place for you. As we close, I, I'm reminded of, of a story. And it's, it's a real story. It's a funny story. But I have two dogs. I have a lab named Reed and a golden doodle named Ruby. And these dogs are a mess. But Reed has always had a problem. Now, Ruby, she is amazing. 
we can let her out the door and she'll just you know walk around with us we don't have to use a leash she's just awesome but Reed ever since he was a puppy whenever he got the chance he's gone <laughs> he takes off and good luck catching him and you know and as a good pet owner you know especially with where they live on Bonham and how crazy people can drive down that road when, when he gets out I chase after him. I try my best to find him. But he's fast. <laughs> and he can go places I can't. And even though I'm searching, I'm trying to find him. And he has a place at our home. He has an inheritance. He has a home. And I'm searching for him. I came, I come to him, I try to get him. It's really up to him on if he decides if he wants to come back. And there was one day, you can ask Micah, it was early in the morning, he, he got out. This was before we had our other dog. and I tried, I just searched and searched, I couldn't find him. And finally, I, it was like 9.30, I'd spent an hour, I was already late. And I just had to leave. Because as much as I was searching, he didn't want to be found. But I had to trust that he knew that he had an inheritance, a home that he could come to where he was loved and he had food and water and shelter. So I come to the church and I come home for lunch and I see Reed laying on the porch just looking at me. I'm thinking, okay, here we go again. I'm going to get out of the Jeep and he's going to take off. But I get out of the Jeep and he comes right up to me and he lets me guide him. Do you know that God is the same way with you? He has an inheritance for you, but he just wants you to be like those daughters. Trust him. Trust in his promises. He has promised that if you will confess your sin, believe and trust in his son Jesus, that you will be a child of his, that you will have a home and inheritance. But you have to be bold, just like they were bold. It takes a step of faith. That's hard for us to do. But would you be bold? Maybe you don't know the Lord Jesus. Maybe you haven't found this home, this inheritance. Maybe you're running. You're chasing after something. But God is chasing you. He sent his son Jesus to the earth for you and he's just waiting for you to come home, for you to accept that inheritance. So maybe be bold this morning. But maybe, maybe you have that inheritance. Maybe you have followed the Lord Jesus. You've accepted him as your Lord and Savior. You're following him. You've believed in the promises, but maybe you need to be bold in them. Maybe you need to seek the Lord and how you need to handle a certain situation in your life. Maybe you need to be obedient to what God is calling you to do in that situation. Listen to him this morning. Let's pray. Father, I just pray in this moment that you would give us all the boldness and the courage to respond to however you may be speaking to us this morning. Whatever that may look like, whatever decision, whatever situation that's in our lives, you're calling us to, to get right with you. I pray that you would give us the boldness, just like those daughters of Zalofa had had, to come and make it right. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Would you please stand?
know my prayer for all of us is that this week we may be like Noah and her sisters. We may have that boldness, that confidence, that trust in the Lord. Let me pray for us as we leave. Father, we just love you so much and we thank you for all that you have provided for us through Jesus. And Father, I pray that from this moment forward, we would live in those promises. That we would trust in those promises. That we would live in boldness through those promises. Father, that we would seek your will and be obedient to you in our lives. Give us that boldness and that strength. It's in the name of Jesus that we ask this. Amen.